This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 122, recorded on February 18th, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. The first one up, usually when Alio's here, he's... In deference to his age, I, I introduce him first. I thought you went west to east. No, I always figure he's, uh, he's, he's a guy we have a lot of respect for. We should introduce him first. I don't know, it probably doesn't make any sense, right? Not that <laughs> I don't. West to that's east That's right. Better. Be careful. With your... I do not have no, zero respect. I have equal respect for everyone on the show, but he's oldest, so that pushes him over the edge. How's that? More, more senior, let's more senior. say. <laughs> Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Welcome back, both of you. Thank you. Thanks. It's been a while, and I miss uh, when we're all together because we have a good conversation. Last week, I was in Washington, D.C. for ASM Biodefense. How was it? I just went and did a twim and left. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. My, but ma my master's student was up there. She was presenting a poster on her phage work that we're still doing with one of my collaborators from when I was working in phage. And so she had a paper or a poster at the biodefense meeting. So she was really excited and I was sorry I couldn't join them all. They had a good time, but they had airplane troubles. So I was glad I wasn't there. Yeah, it was a, uh, when I went, I took the train down. It was snowing the whole time. So yeah, that could be an issue. Um, today the weather's nice here, but Michael, do you have warm weather down there? We have about 60 degrees and it's, <laughs> it's been beautifully sunny. Wow. Uh, it's one degree Celsius here. I bet ooh. it's cold in Michigan, right? It's cold. Do you have a lot of snow, Michelle? No, not very little. Yeah. Just a dusting. Me too. All right. Well, we will proceed with that. Alia, who is the victim of a virus? Influenza A. Gets all of us, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he actually knows he was, uh, they, they figured out what type it was, right? Yeah, they, yeah. they did a nasal swab and they typed him and uh, they recorded what it was. So and They sent it to CDC, I guess. He'll become a statistic. That's right. <laughs> he had the vaccine, so. Yeah, he said, and Michael will explain this, but he only had mm -hmm. one of the two doses that he needed, right, Michael? Yeah, uh, unless they had preloaded the double dose. Elio, as many of you know, is is over that magic age when they recommend uh, a double inoculum of the influenza virus for folks over the age of 60. And he said he only had one dose, so I'm wondering if they didn't have the right vaccine when he got vaccinated and they yeah. just forgot to give him two pokes. Well, hopefully he shall be better for our next twim. In the meantime, we forge on. And but he, he sent a question. He did he send a question. A, be, he sent a be question cool. to all of us. So when, when you're done with your snippet, Michael, we can do that question. Yes. This episode of TWIM is sponsored by Microbe Magazine Podcast. This is a new production of ASM, a monthly show hosted by Jeff Fox, who is the current topics and features editor for Microbe Magazine. Those of you who are members of ASM may know every month or so you get a magazine in the mail. It's called Microbe Magazine. So Jeff is the current topics and features editor for that. And each podcast episode coincides with an article in the current issue of ASM's member magazine. For example, episode eight focuses on making yeast strains for producing lager beers with new flavor notes. You can find Microbe Magazine podcast on iTunes. Just search for Microbe Magazine or go to microbeworld.org slash MMP. And check out Microbe Magazine podcast. And Michael, what have you got for us? Well, I have a really neat paper, given that spring is about to sprung forth here in Charleston, and I was updating my <laughs> lecture for the dental students on Borrelia. Before each lecture, I go out and scan the literature, see if there's anything new. And this month, there's a new paper in Lancet ID 
entitled Identification of a Novel Pathogenic Borrelia Species Causing Lyme Borreliosis with Unusually High uh, Spirochidemia. And it's a descriptive study. It's by Bobby Pritt and a cast of other authors who are, uh, there's a large number. I commend it to the show notes for you to see them all. It's by no way slighting them. And they're at the Mayo Clinic, the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases from the CDC in Fort Collins, and the Department of Health Services and various other micro-affiliated departments at the University of Wisconsin at Madison and the Health Department for the state of Wisconsin. The first author, Bobby Pritt, was on TWIP uh, yes. some time ago. She is well known for her parasitology, and she was on TWIP number 75. It was called Parasite Wonders with Bobby Pritt. And another author I happen to know here is Robin Patel from the ICAC Program Committee. As do I. She's the chair of it now, right? I believe so, but it's all merged into Microbe, which is the That's new right. meeting. That's right. I forgot. And so they're, <laughs> they're all one big happy family. So they merged the program committees too? I think so. Uh. I think they too have all merged. So before we get started, we have to have a Latin lesson or a Latin digression. And they use this term throughout um, their manuscript, and it's senso stricto, senso lato, <laughs> and the other senso you can use is senso amplo. And what it means is senso stricto means in the strictest sense. Sento lasso, lato means in the broad, broader, or broadest sense. And the amplo version of senso is in a relaxed or more relaxed state. And it's simply to tell you about how they came up with this new species of Borrelia that will cause this syndrome known as Lyme Borreliosis. Lyme, of course, is referring to Lyme, Connecticut, a city or a, a town, and not specifically a person. So oftentimes it's the fingernails on the blackboard to me when someone says Lyme's disease. <laughs> it's, it's a city or a town, so it's Lyme. And so back to the issue at hand. In this study, in the bullet, they, they have described a novel Borrelia species causing this uh, Borreliosis, which means Borrelia is in your, your bloodstream. And they named it uh, Candidate Borrelio after the Mayo Clinic, Mayo Nye. And I think it's going to be abstracted into Borrelia mayonnaise. If, if they, yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. <laughs> if they're not careful. And this has been found amongst patients and uh, the tick population from the upper Midwest in the United States. And what they did is they established a causal role for this new species of Borrelia being responsible. So they showed that this species of Borrelia could cause the patient's illness, and they detected it by DNA via the PCR and from patient specimens during the acute illness. And they also, and this is what's unusual and why I added it to, to my lectures, they detected modal spirochetes in one blood specimen. And that's very unusual for Lyme Borreliosis. Rarely do you see spirochetes in the blood of classic Borrelia burgdorferi Borreliosis. Is culture part of the diagnosis for, tip for uh, Lyme disease? No, never. Huh? Typically, it's not. Mm. Typically, uh, what they do is it's the rash and it's the clinical presentation that typically sets it off. And one of the hallmarks of Lyme disease is. You get the fever, the chills, the headache, the fatigue, the muscle, and the joint aches, which Elio will tell you is flu today because he's experiencing it. <laughs> but it's also the early signs and symptoms of the Lyme disease. But that typically occurs three to 30 days after a tick bite. But the hallmark symptom that really tells your doctor you have Lyme is you get this rash, typically in close proximity to the tick bite, called erythema migrans. And the rash does not represent an allergic reaction to the bite of this tick, but rather it's the actual skin infection with the bacteria responsible for, for Lyme. And this rash typically 
begins to migrate, hence its name, migrans. So it almost looks like you have a bullseye at the source of the rash. So where the tick bites you is, is dark red, then there's a clear zone, and then there's another reddening. And this typically occurs, again, at about between 3 and 30 days. 7 is about the average of getting bit by a tick. But the rash gradually expands over this period of days, reaching up to 12 inches or 30 centimeters as the um, condition progresses. The rash may feel warm to the touch, but unlike most rashes, when we think of rash, it's not itchy or, or painful. So those are the early symptoms associated with the disease. And this new species causes all of those things like the candidate or the canonical species of Lyme, Bordorfii. And so they found this new microbe, and the way they did it is, is pretty interesting. And it, it brings up why I think it's important to discuss on TWIM, because the Mayo is a reference lab, and the way they did this remarkable paper is they had approximately 100,000 samples and the Mayo Clinic is the routine uh, reference lab, I guess, if you will, for this catchment basin for where they collect. And they collected from 2003 to 2014. They routinely test clinical diagnostic specimens from patients all over the U.S. And they use a, a PCR assay to ask the question whether or not they have Borrelia burgdorferi senso lato. So they had 100. Yes, um- Just to clarify, when you say a reference lab, that means all the physicians in that region send their samples to that place, correct? I think so. I think that is what they are doing for this group or the study did this for this group. I couldn't quite figure out how they got all 100,000 of the species, but the Mayo I just mean that the term reference lab may not resonate with everyone, so... And I don't know whether or not the samples came from the CDC that this, out of the Vector Clinic or, or whatnot. So that wasn't abundantly clear in the Lancet paper, how they got all the, the specimens. And so what they did is they had these 100,000 species, or excuse me, specimens, and uh, they screened the samples via PCR for the presence of three Borrelia species, the canonical species Bordorfii, Senso stricto, Afzelii, and Garnii via real-time PCR that used a hybridization probe targeting the oligopeptide binding protein, and this OPA1 gene binds from two to five amino acids long, and it has a preference for basic peptides. But it's unique to Borrelia burgdorferi, and it's able to discriminate Borrelia burgdorferi or Lyme from um, other Borrelia species that cause other spirochete-based diseases like relapsing fever. Uh, They subjected the PCR products to melting temperatures and did a wide variety of things. And what they found out of those 100,000 specimens is they found from the specimens collected from January 2012 to September 2014, and there were 9,100 samples from residents of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and North Dakota. They were submitted to the Mayo in Rochester, and they looked for these things. Of these almost 10,000 samples that they screened, they found five curious ones that had an atypical pattern. And they then began to further work those up, and they worked them up by this thermal melting profile, and they then subjected them to sequence analysis of their 16S ribosomal RNA, a number of other housekeeping genes, and then they took those results and subjected them to multilocus sequence typing. I've put a reference in the show notes for multilocus sequence typing so you can look for it. And what multilocus sequence typing does is it takes, in this case, they used eight housekeeping genes, and they ask the question, are they different amongst themselves? And so what they've learned is that they indeed were different from the canonical species or 
the the strict Borrelia burgdorferi and using this eight gene multi locus sequence analysis and the published threshold for the delineation of burgdorferi senso lato genome species, they found this new group. The most significant finding that they had is since they only had six samples uh, that were now positive for this proposed new species is they were able to evaluate them clinically. And what they learned is the spirochetes, the Borrelia, were seen in the diluted blood of a patient who presented with a single erythema migrans lesion. And they estimated that by microscopy that this individual had approximately 10 to the 5 genome copies per mil of their blood. The rule of thumb is you can see 100,000 spirochetes and you can see 100,000 bacteria under a microscope without too much effort. And that's what they indeed did. They saw spirochetes in this patient's blood, whereas with normal Lyme samples, you can rarely detect spirochetes in the patient's blood. And then they worked out, um, they have very elegant graphs showing how they worked out the copy number of the Borrelia that they were finding in in these patients' bloods. And they found that they had between 100,000 and a million genome copies per milliliter. And this is 50 to 8,000 times higher than the blood specimens that are routinely tested for Lyme that we see throughout the United States. And Lyme is a big deal in the United States. There are about 300 cases estimated annually in the U.S. And this is the most common tick-borne disease in the Northern Hemisphere. In Europe, they also have it, and there's about 85,000 cases. To the best of my ability to tell from the CDC graph, the only states exempt without Lyme are Colorado and Hawaii. Hmm. And if you look at the map, and I put an interactive map also into the show notes, so you can roll out from 2000 all the way to the time the CDC has made maps for up to 2014. You see the disease is clustered in the northeastern United States with the bullseye being right in Lyme, Connecticut, and it's slowly spreading westward, and there's a cluster. It's a very dark cluster in the map in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, and uh, northern Illinois, and creeping down into Iowa. And each dot on the CDC's map actually represents one confirmed case of what's going on with with this very seemingly aggressive uh, spirochete. Michael, and, this uh, this new species, there are only a handful of cases here, but presumably this is geogra- geographically distributed like the other? Is that yes. Cool? And, you- and in fact, they went out and began to hunt for the ticks. And they think they have, you know, the spirochetes are beginning to go after these, these new ticks. Mm. And uh, again, as, as Elio often says, stay tuned because I think now the health department is going to go out and do a much more aggressive survey of the tick population to know what's actually going on. I think but, saying that the spirochetes are going after the ticks is a little bit. No, <laughs> no, no the, the health department workers <laughs> are going after the ticks okay. to check on the... Yeah, you the, said the spirochetes were going after the Yeah. I didn't want to say that. They're not. They just happen to get they're picked not. up. They just happen <laughs> to get picked up. Is this disease any different from the Bergdorferi-induced disease? Or right it- now, it doesn't appear to okay. be any different. But again, what troubles me is that the number of copies in the bloodstream could enter that, and again, the people who remember their syphilis lectures will probably recall the Jerex herxheimer reaction <laughs> in which you all those little spirochetes have God-fearing endotoxin because they're gram-negative. And in the old days when you gave penicillin to someone who had high spirochete levels in their blood from syphilis, you would release that massive amount of endotoxin from the lysis of the Mm, spirochete and you get this Jerex-Herxheimer reaction. 
Well, one of the patients that patient specimens actually had that, and the rule of thumb is if you go down this path of the Jerex Herxheimer reaction, you stop the antibiotic immediately because you don't want to continue dumping all that LPS into uh, the patient system because you'll get shot. And so, you know, Jerex Herxheimer is just not uh, associated with uh, syphilis. It's it's associated with penicillin treatment in syphilis, but you can also see it with uh, leptospirosis and Q fever and cat scratch disease. Anytime you overload in the spirochetes, you know, dump out mm, uh, yeah. large amounts of LPS. And so that's what really triggered my interest in this paper is the fact that you had high levels of spirochetes in the blood and the fact that they picked it up is as part of the routine that they were doing because the the PCR wasn't calling it Lyme or specifically Lyme borreliosis because it wasn't in the candidate species. So that's what really tripped me because anytime, you know, the pathogen begins to change its spots because typically in Lyme you have about 0.1 spirochetes per mil of blood. And here you're having a million, uh, between 100,000 and, and a million spirochetes per blood. Mm. That opens up the potential that this could have a different syndrome. The other thing that we know about Lyme is if it left go untreated, you can develop the, the late acting symptoms, which you get the um, severe headaches and neck, neck stiffness. It can go into Lyme arthritis. Mm-hmm. where you have severe joint pain, the facial or Bell's palsies. You can end up with heart palpitations through Lyme carditis and episodes of dizziness and nerve pain. So once it migrates into that clinical syndrome, and it generally takes for the later signs and symptoms to appear, it's typically months after the tick bite and you didn't know you had a tick bite because – your significant other didn't tell you have your big rash on your back that you normally can't see. Michael, if you don't treat it and you can get those late symptoms and then those are not treatable anymore, is that correct? They're very hard to deal with, yes. So, so you can have persistence for many years and it's it's difficult to eliminate with antibiotics, right? Correct, because mm-hmm. of where the tick or where the spirochete has set up housekeeping. Yeah. So this involves CNS invasion, right? Yes. And that can be fatal. That can be fatal. Yeah. So if you have a bullet-shaped rash rash on your arm, you should go get a blood test, make sure it's not Lyme, right? You should effectively seek physician advice, and they may just prescribe. And the drug of choice is um, a tetracycline derivative like doxycycline and other things. So it it can be treated, but it comes generally with a longer uh, course of antibiotics in case it's already set up reservoirs. I had a I had a rash a bullet shaped rash a number of years ago. It was on my arm, and I swear it was I bumped into something. But my significant other said you need to go get a blood test. So I went. And were you positive? No, it was negative. Well, negative. you could have had the first species of this mayonnaise. Maybe, but it was just I bumped into something, you know. But significant <laughs> under, others recall. they don't believe you. <laughs> oh, because they care. Well, because they care. No, we're just absent-minded scientists who can't. <laughs> Trusted to take Speak care of yourself. Ourselves. So, Michael, are they going to need to um, broaden their molecular test then, their diagnostic test? I, I think they're going to expand their PCR repertoire, expand their PCR. But, of course, that takes uh, a larger number of samples and, you know, you have to effectively get it vetted by the CSLI guidelines and all of those other things. Hmm. Hmm. So... Elio's question to us all. Mm-hmm. Could, before we go on, could I could I mention that um, sure. on February 19th, the American Academy of Microbiology is releasing a new report on applications of um, next generation sequencing for clinical diagnosis. So it's tomorrow. Um, for, yeah, but it'll be last <laughs> it'll week be for live. our listeners. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It'll be so, live. So um, and so, there's also an MBio review um, from this uh, colloquium. Michelle, uh, can anybody get that? Well, it's embargoed until tomorrow, but yes, it will be available freely online and we can link to it in the show notes. Wonderful. That's good news. I might heard about that. That's great. So what does Elio want to know? Okay, Michelle? so why do ticks transmit so many and so varied pathogens? 16, as Wikipedia says in counting, 
some at the same time are ticks the champion transmitters. And he, he admonishes us, go ahead and figure it out. I think humans are the champion transmitters. Mm-hmm. I, I, I would agree with that. But I think it's principally because they bite you and they defecate. And many of these pathogens that are transmitted by ticks are really pretty wimpy pathogens like rickettsia and spirochetes. We know they're very fragile microbes. And consequently, they couldn't withstand the rigors of the digestive system if it, they were fecal orally transmitted. And secondly, if they were a respiratory pathogen, it would be very challenging for them because of desiccation. We know that treponema pallidum, the causative agent of syphilis, is extremely unstable as it desiccates down, and which is why you typically can't get syphilis from uh, toilet seats if you're shedding the bacterium uh, because they dry out and they effectively die. So I think it's because a lot of these, it's a blood, uh, the, the tick bites you and um, rickettsia and other of the pathogens that are really nasty. They typically come out as fecal material from the tick and the tick is embedded in our skin and it's bit us. And so it has ready access to our transport system, whether it be our lymph nodes our lymphatic system or our blood system. I would say that mosquitoes beat ticks out. I was going to ask about mosquitoes. Oh, yeah, way that's more. certainly on our mind right now. With way more. Zika. We got a we have a dozen viruses. We have parasites. It adds up to way more than 17. Than but ticks. but in fact, it may just be we haven't found them all, who knows, right? Mm. That I, could be. I do think that taking blood meals has a lot to do with it obviously. Right? Yeah. These are all these are all microbes that are bloodborne, so a tick or a mosquito picking it up. Now, you know, the difference between a tick and a mosquito is a tick hangs around for a while. It latches on, doesn't it? Yeah, whereas mosquitoes are pretty transient. They come, boom, Mm -hmm. in less than a minute, they're gone. And they inject or they bite. And, of course, there are other vectors, insect vectors of diseases also that are not mosquitoes or ticks, right? So uh, it all adds up. Someone at a seminar yesterday said, why do bats carry so many viruses? And someone said, well, that's because we look for them. (laughs) In bats, <laughs> a lot, and we're focused, but maybe many other species too. So who knows? But I think mosquitoes do beat ticks out. And this brings up an interesting question. You know, in light of the Zika virus uh, outbreak, uh, people are talking about getting rid of mosquitoes, <laughs> which, and we have talked about this a lot, which is a, a crazy thing because mosquitoes have their place in the world's ecology. They don't just bite us, they bite other animals. And they regulate populations of other animals, so you can't just wipe them out, although many people would like to get rid of them. Well, in fact, uh, South Carolina is uh, having its uh, time in the sun politically, and one of the candidates yesterday said, first thing I'm going to do is remove all the mosquitoes. And that, of course, in general, <sighs> laugh. But again, it's it's that <laughs> craziness. You know, that's how these ideas get started. Get rid of all the mosquitoes. And Donald Trump wants to shut down the Internet. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So, Vincent, um, Mm. a lot of the nasty viruses that we're worried about are carried by a particular species of mosquito. That's right. Can we selectively knock out that species and and, and worry less about the ecology? I think you could do local eradication or or, or severe population reduction, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. If you bring the mosquito numbers down, say 90%, you could probably really make an impact on transmission. To humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then you'd have to keep doing that season after season, right? Right. And, and people are developing really interesting technologies for doing that, for either, you know, putting the, – the one that was used in Brazil is to uh, basically uh, wipe out the population by putting a gene in that will kill uh, the newborn larvae. And there are other approaches, too, to putting Wolbachia in mosquitoes so viruses right. can't replicate in them. So, I mean, that may be better than – Wiping them out. But I think you, you could, Michelle, wipe out local populations, but you couldn't say get rid of all the mosquitoes in, in Africa. That would be really hard because so many animals that they feed on and so forth. And other species would move into that space. Yeah, that's the thing. Yep. As soon as you take one away, maybe another one would move in. Right. Right. And there's certainly lots of different species of mosquitoes around. Thousands of different ones. Probably we don't even know them all. It's amazing. I say just stay inside and uh, read a good book. I know, Michelle, you like the golf. You you wear long pants, right? No, probably not. 
in the winter. <laughs> Not in the summer. I think you need to have sh- long sleeves and long pants all year round, and then you reduce Are you your- implying that I don't stay on the fairway? Ooh. <laughs> That I have to go into, into the, the woods, woods to right retrieve there, my no, ball. Not at all. Aren't there mosquitoes on the <laughs> fairway? <laughs> There's more in the in the in the, the rush. Yeah. Hey, I just <laughs> just uh, out of curiosity, Michelle, when you do golf, do you notice mosquitoes? Yeah, and I I carry around a a bottle of of uh, repellent. Repellent. Yeah. I think that's the thing. That's that really helps a lot to have repellent, mm-hmm. but also to eliminate standing water. Uh, many mosquitoes grow in uh, in bodies of water, but eighties mosquitoes. Like little um, tree holes, for example. Or the Cups. hole that the ball goes in. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> if, uh, yeah, these little cups of water, they, they lay their eggs just at the water line and then the water goes down. And then the next season when the water goes over the eggs, they hatch and you have new mosquitoes. So these are called tree hole. I know this from Dixon de Pommier. So it really, if you take care of standing water, this can make a big impact on mosquito species. Now, ticks but are that's another easier thing. Easier said than done. Yes, of course. But ticks are another problem. Those are not easy to get rid of. No. But you should just stay away from the places where they are, right? Or, or just wear the appropriate clothing. And yeah. I think that's what you know. There, there's also a bias in, in terms of the sex that this disease is affecting. It's principally going after men, and I guess mm. it's because the men are out in the woods uh, hunting, and I think that's. Part of the issue as well. I don't know if there is a true sex bias or it's a activity bias. Which disease are you talking about uh, now? Lyme. Michael? For Lyme. Lyme. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because the the hunting in Wisconsin, students actually bring their shotguns to the dorms at some institutions in Wisconsin and they check them into a locker. My nephew, having gone to University of Wisconsin campus, said, Yeah, we check in the guns and then we go out hunting mm. when hunting season starts. So Willie Bergdorfer, after whom uh, Borrelia Bergdorferi is named, he died uh, November 2014. We actually men- yeah. mentioned it here on Twim, and he was living in Hamilton, Montana, which is where the Rocky Mountain Lab is, and they have a big mm-hmm. tick uh, lab there where they. And I remember I visited a couple of years ago, and one of the postdocs was saying, "I'm going to go out and collect ticks tomorrow because they have lots of tick bearing bushes in the." In the vicinity, you just take a cloth and you drag it through the oh my. brush and they stick to it. Yeah. And in fact, that's why Rocky Mountain Lab is in Hamilton from Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, yeah, another right. tick-borne disease. That's right. They, they're very Which we have in South Carolina. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael. That was thank lovely. You. Uh, it's very interesting. A new species. It's probably been around for a while. We just didn't find it, right? Yep. That's we just discovered it. Although I thought they said they went back and looked at a number of samples previously and they could not detect it. They so did. There is some evidence that it's either moved in or it's newly emerged. Brand new. mm. mm-hmm. Okay. This episode is also sponsored by ASM Microbe, the all new meeting from ASM. It is the general meeting in ICAC under one roof. You have until May 5th to take advantage of early bird registration rates. This meeting is happening in Boston, Massachusetts from June 16th through the 20th, and it will feature the best microbial sciences in the world, and it will explore the full scope of microbiology, new venues and programs to spark discussion and interactions with your colleagues around the campus of the meeting and in the exhibit and poster hall. And of course, don't forget, we'll have a twim and a twiv from the meeting. So come by and listen as we chat with virologists and microbiologists. Or if you can't make it, come by afterwards and say hello. I think the twim will be Friday at 2.45 and twiv is Saturday about 8 a.m. Never too early to talk about microbes. If your work touches the microbial sciences, this is the meeting that you should attend, learn, connect, and advance at the inaugural ASM Microbe 2016. If you want to learn more and register, visit asm.org slash asmmicrobe, all one word. We thank ASM for their support of TWIM. All right, we have a paper for you, which is in cell. It's entitled, The Host Shapes the Gut Microbiota via Fecal MicroRNA. And the authors are from Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. And the PI is Howard Weiner, who I knew years ago because he used to be a virologist. I guess he was seduced by the microbiome. The first author is Xiong Liu, 
Pires da Cunha, Resende, Cialic, Way, Bry, Comstock, and Gandhi. And when I sent out this paper, Elio said, take everything about the microbiome with a grain of salt. <laughs> However, this is very interesting. I found this really neat and kind of unusual. And it's early days, of course, as usual. But this is all about our gut microbiome, which many listeners know we acquire from our mother. And then it is shaped, the different bacteria that are growing in our guts is shaped up until about three years of age. And then it stabilizes and resembles the, the adult microbiome. It's shaped by what you eat, the people you interact with, whether you get sick or not, the environment, and your own genetics. Of course, we have a big influence on how our microbiome develops. So in this paper, they're trying to figure out one component of the host contribution to the microbiome. And what they are looking at are microRNAs. And these are short RNAs, 18 to 23 nucleotides are found in eukaryotic cells. They are made as longer precursors. They're processed. And then they're sent out into the cytoplasm where they modulate gene regulation. They typically bind to non-coding regions of messenger RNAs, and they can lead to their degradation or inhibition of translation. So we, eukaryotic cells make a lot of microRNAs. To, to my knowledge, these are not made in bacteria. They're used in eukaryotes to regulate gene expression. And the eukaryotic genome encodes thousands of microRNAs. So what did they do in this study? They looked for microRNAs in the feces of humans and mice. It has been previously known that you can find them in there, but nobody has studied them very much. And they found them in the stool. They found them by electrophoresis. And they think that they are produced, or sec I should say secreted from the cells of the intestine, the cells lining the intestine, by vesicles, membranous vesicles called exosomes. And in fact, if they purify the exosome fraction, they see lots of these microRNAs and not a lot of ribosomal RNA, which is what you see also if you just purify total RNA from the intestine. In the mouse, they found 283 different microRNAs. That's incredible. Out of uh, hundreds that they looked for. And some are more abundant than others. They sequence the small RNA population and they can tell which ones are more abundant than others. So they also looked in the fecal samples and they saw a little little vesicles, which look like exosomes. So exosomes, for those of you who don't know, uh, these are membranous vesicles released by eukaryotic cells, and they typically contain something that is meant for delivery elsewhere, like a microRNA. The placenta, for example, releases microRNAs from the syncytial trophoblast, the outer layer, and th these uh, exosomes are full of microRNAs, and they're antiviral, actually, and they can contain, these exosomes contain, contain other things as well. Anyway, so they saw uh, exosomes or vesicles in the feces, and um, they believe these contain uh, the most abundant RNAs. They also did a similar study in human fecal samples. They found 181 microRNAs in human feces. And I don't think this has been done before, so nobody has looked in this detail to sequence them and find out what they are. And 17 of the microRNAs were shared between uh, mouse and humans. So these have specific sequences, of course, because they have specific targets. Uh, in the eukaryotic genes. Now, in the mouse, the microRNAs are found at different levels depending on where you look. So there are more abundant microRNAs in the ileal lumen compared with the colon, for example. Well, that makes sense because that's where all the um, hardwired circuitry to talk to our system is located. So if the microRNAs are doing stuff to our genes it would make sense for them to come out. And if the bacteria are stimulating the intestinal cells mm -hmm. and telling them, hey, we're here, uh, do this behavior, it, it would make sense that that's where they would likely go. But the, there are more bacteria in the colon, right? Well, though, that's debris. If we listen to it's what all debris, Eli really? It's not actually living bacteria? Well, if if you think about what we were talking about the last time I did twin with us all talking about the ratio paper, you know, right, going right. from 10 to 1 down to 1 to 1, maybe it's, you know, the colon is just really getting rid of the actors after they have done their 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 job and yeah, they're just yeah. moving them out. Anyway, then they um, say, let's compare the microRNAs in germ-free mice versus what we call specific pathogen-free mice, which as the name indicates, they don't have certain pathogens, but they do have 
bacteria in their in their guts, and they find micro more microRNAs in the germ-free mice compared with uh, in the feces of germ-free mice compared with the feces of pathogen-free mice. And when they treat mice with antibiotics to bring down the population of gut microbes, they see an increase in the microRNA in the feces. So there's some kind of relationship between the bacteria in the gut and these microRNAs. But it's the opposite of what you might think if the microRNAs are meant to suppress yes. the microbial populations. It's yes. actually the inverse correlation. Right, it is. And in fact, we'll see that these are probably not suppressing, at least the ones right. that they look at. Yeah. Next question is, where are these microRNAs coming from? So, you know, you have uh, intestinal epithelial cells, and then you have specialized cells like goblet cells and panneth cells, and they have a way... So this is so cool. This is just an amazing illustration of what you can do in science nowadays. So Dicer is the eukaryotic enzyme that processes the precursors of microRNAs into the shorter RNAs. And they can make cell type specific knockouts of the Dicer gene, right? By using a specific promoter. And so they can make Dicer, they can knock Dicer specifically out in the intestinal epithelial cells, right? When they do that, those mice make a lot less microRNAs compared to wild-type mice. So the intestinal epithelial cells are a major source of microRNAs. They can also do dicer knockouts in panneth cells and in goblet cells. And these also, the results of these also show that they produce microRNAs, but they're different from the microRNAs produced by the intestinal epithelial cells. Um, they also did the same kind of experiments in B cells and T cells. We know there are B and T cells in the gut. And um, if you do a dicer knockout, it doesn't really affect the amount of microRNA in the feces. So the immune cells there are not playing much of a role. Uh, another experiment they did, which is kind of neat, they treat they feed mice dextran sulfate sodium, which is a way, an experimental way of inducing colitis. So what this does is it, it destroys the epithelial cells and it gives you some loss of goblet cells. and and that's a model that people have used for studying colitis. We'll come back to that later. But this causes a decrease in the total microRNA population. So you're ablating these um, cells, confirming the knockout studies that, in fact, the, the epithelial cells are really important. All right, now um, let's look at the bacterial populations. So they have, again, these mice who don't make dicer. And again, dicer is the enzyme that, that processes the microRNAs. They don't make dicer in the epithelial intestinal cells. They take the gut, the, the luminal contents from these mice and do 16S RNA, ribosomal RNA sequencing to see what populations of bacteria are, are there. And when they remove the microRNAs, it causes a change in the microbiome, in the gut microbiome. And this is observed as a shift of the dominant phyla compared with wild type mice. And that the, the firmicutes and the proteobacteria are different compared with wild-type mice. And they also see differences at the family level. They see increases of specific families of bacteria and decreases uh, of others. So taking out microRNAs is changing the microbiome population, basically. So how does this happen? How is a microRNA affecting the growth of uh, gut bacteria? So for these studies, they looked at two specific bacteria, Fusobacterium nucleatum and E. coli. First they do is they take the sequence of these microRNAs that are predominant in the feces, and then they ask, are they in the genomes of these two bacteria? And the answer is yes. There are plenty of target sites, so maybe somehow they're targeting the genome. Uh, so they do an experiment where they simply grow these two bacteria in liquid culture, and they add microRNA to the culture. They use, they use two bacteria, as I said, and two different microRNAs, and they stimulate growth. <laughs> that, that was the most amazing result to me. So I wanted to ask you guys, if you look at those growth curves, I mean, it's not huge, but it's certainly it's going up a few. It's different. It's different. I, I think that's what I would say is, and that's pretty remarkable considering how quickly the bacterial systems modulate their messenger RNA expression. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we tried to do this uh, back uh, in the late 90s, we were using ribozymes 
that were being injected via phage to try to control mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. bacterial growth. And the issue that we had is that it wasn't lethal enough because we were trying lethal agents with the, the ribozymes to cleave specific messages. And because messages turn over so quickly in bacteria, we have to figure out what the target is and whether or not they're going after stable messages or the various messages that are involved in the various programs that the microbe is, is expressing in the niche that it presently occupies and the behavior it's presently manifesting. So yeah. that's that's what I thought was cool. Yeah. The fact that you know the growth curves aren't black and white is a function of when they're pulling the population out to try to answer the question. And it's going to be really hard because we know we can't get synchronous growth for bacteria when we're growing it in the lab because various microbes that are various different stages of life. So how it's going on in the gut where you're feeding it and, you know, they're in various stages of processing because mice are eating at varying rates. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's it's going to be interesting, but... but this- this lab experiment with pure cultures is really surprising because, as Vincent said, they add the microRNA, they see growth promotion, and then if they scramble that microRNA mm-hmm. or if they make site-directed mutants mm-hmm. that um, are predicted to not interact with a known target, they don't see that. So it's not simply adding RNA. There's some specificity yeah, to sure. this that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, that's the perturbation in the population because you... In a lab culture, you never have synchrony. It it may be an exponential growth, but that's the sum of the population. It's not an an individualized cell. Yeah. Some cells are doing different things in that growth. At different time. And that's that's what screwed us up in our our analysis as well. You have to reduce it to a much smaller number of cells in order to to see it. But it's, it's nevertheless absolutely fascinating. Uh, the next experiment, they made fluorescent versions of these microRNAs, and they add they simply add them to bacteria, and then look at them in the microscope, and they basically get in and and localize with nucleic acids. So they they stain nucleic acids with a dye that you know stains everything blue, all the nucleic acid blue. And you can see the fluorescent microRNAs go in and sit next to the nucleic acids, and that must be their target, right? Because that's mm-hmm. what that's what they do in eukaryotic cells. So they had used two different microRNAs in this growth curve that I just mentioned. Uh, one targets a 16S ribosomal RNA of the fusobacterium, and the other targets a gene called YEGH of E. coli. And they act basically say if we add the microRNAs to cultures, what happens to these RNAs? And the transcripts go up, which is really weird because in, in mammalian cells, microRNAs downregulate transcripts. They degrade them where they inhibit translation. So this is doing something very different and um, it has to be further sorted out, of course, but it's actually increasing the transcripts and that may be partially responsible for the increased growth. All right, so all this is in culture. What about in animals? So mice don't have this fusobacterium nucleatum in them. So they feed the mice the bacterium and then the mice are either wild type or they have a knockout of dicer in the intestinal epithelial cell, so they can't make microRNAs. And so when you do this, the mice who are wild type make more fusobacterium in their feces than the mice that can't make dicer. Okay, so that's kind of an artificial experiment because you're feeding the mice bacteria. What about the microbes that are there? Can they be shaped by microRNA? So what they do is they isolate fecal microRNA from either wild type mice or dicer null mice, again, mice that can't make microRNAs, and they feed those RNAs to either dicer null mice or wild-type mice. And if you feed the mice wild-type RNA, you change the gut microbiota in the recipients. If you feed them RNA from knockout mice, the dicer knockout mice, there's less of a change. And they ruled out that it was... So you're feeding these mice extracts fecal extract. So they rule out that it's antibody or cytokine mediated. So simply feeding mice microRNA can induce a change in their gut microbiome. They also put these two stimulatory microRNAs in drinking water for 48 hours. And uh, 
one of the two increases the abundance of E. coli in the feces. So that, these, that was startling to me. Yeah, just put it in the water. Yeah. <laughs> So maybe someday we're going to be modulating our microbiomes by drinking microRNAs. Well, it's exciting, right? It if, is. If they can it is. Yeah. Dial in some specificity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and if you think about what the host is doing by putting them in, if you will, these little packages, because the issue with always these silencing RNAs or microRNAs is getting them to the right spot. In the case of the Intestinal microbiome, you just have to swallow a little pill yeah, and it would get to the right spot and you could design the pill so that it would dissolve not in the stomach but in the right spot in the small intestine as it would go through. And so you could actually get to that next level of control rather than just drinking a cocktail of of stool or – and, doing. and you don't have to worry about having to culture these guys. Oh, no. Right? You, 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 just, you just put microRNAs. Maybe that can manipulate the population sufficiently, right? Now, yeah. I mean, and, there, there may be situations when you're, when you're totally lacking a certain bacterium. And there it's not, but they've well, already showed us you can feed an a organism that doesn't normally have yeah. a bacterium a bacterium, and it goes in. Yeah, that's right. And this could actually keep it there. Maybe. Yeah. Right. That's what's so interesting. These seem to be promoting growth. Right. Mm-hmm. That's right. A particular species. Yeah. The last experiment they do has to do with this uh, colitis model. They noticed that when they knock out dicer in the intestinal epithelial cells of these mice, this is accompanied by changes in gene expression in the intestine. And the genes that are changed are involved in maintenance of the colonic barrier. For example, there are, there are proteins called tight junction proteins that keep intestinal epithelial cells together so there's a barrier and things don't go in or come out so they wondered if somehow microRNAs would be involved in colitis so what they do is they give mice their dextrin uh, sulfate sodium which we said before induces colitis and this has been done before and we know that the DSS induced colitis is dependent on the microbiome so they do this they feed wild type mice or dicer knockout mice, this DSS, and the Dicer knockout mice have greater weight loss, shortening of the colon, uh, infiltration of the uh, the mucosa, and loss of tissue integrity compared with mild-type mice. because They don't have the same microbiome as we've just seen from these studies. And if you transfer fecal RNA from wild-type mice into these uh, DSS-treated mice, it reverses some of these changes. So they think that these microRNAs are also protecting the integrity of the intestinal epithelial barrier, which is really exciting because, you know, many people have colitis and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And maybe they, they have altered microRNA populations, which is something that we should look at. And maybe you could treat it with, with microRNAs. So pretty, I think it's pretty exciting. It's early. And we're going to have to do a lot more to characterize the human microRNA population and see uh, what's modulating what. But I don't know, it's pretty cool, I thought. I actually had the pleasure of talking with the first author, Shuang Lu, um, today, and that's exactly one of the areas that they're pursuing, mm. is, is trying to um, look in colitis models um, to see if this might be the start of a, a therapeutic yeah, design. That's cool. Did you find out how they got interested in doing this? Um, well, they the lab had been interested in uh, multiple sclerosis and regulatory RNAs, but mm. Sharong had the idea of just simply looking in the feces to see if they were present. <laughs> and he he described the day in the lab where he did the qPCR and, and got this huge signal in the feces as like a really exciting moment uh, that he shared with um, with the PI. And then um, he was able to lead the project and ask these pretty sophisticated questions about the impact of the microRNAs on the tissue in the in the gut, but also on the microbial populations, growth of the bugs. Because it's, such, it's a collaborative environment, uh, they were able to uh, partner with Lori Comstock, who has a lot of experience with anaerobes in the gut. And uh, Sharong described that she was quite excited about the experiments and was actually in the lab with him taking hourly time points um, <laughs> for these growth curves with the anaerobes. He also credited the number of core facilities that are available. Um, so his his own um, expertise had been in impact and contribution of the innate immune system, TLR2, to plaques 
that form in Alzheimer's disease. So he, he's interested in um, inflammation, but had no experience studying populations of microbes in the gut, um, which they did here. And he said it's it was just a great environment to do that because they've got core facilities that can do like the 16S sequencing for the microbiota, computational biology um, cores, experts around. So he's, he said it was just has been just a great and exciting uh, project. There's nothing like a good core, right? No. Yeah. It does take a village to do these microbiome experiments. Right. He also, I'll add, um, grew up in um, South Central China in a small village where they had, he was surrounded by animals and nature. He liked to go out and collect um, fruits growing from the trees and just really appreciated the cleanliness and the rural life. Uh, But he went then to medical school and practiced medicine for a couple of years before Mm. realizing that what he really wanted to do was research. So he got a master's in immunology at Peking Union Medical College. Again, realized he wanted to pursue this in more detail. So then he went to Germany and got his PhD. And that's where he did the work on um, toll-like receptor 2 and amyloid related to inflammation in Alzheimer's before joining the um, Weiner lab for this project as a postdoc. Nice. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Mm-hmm. Cool to hear. We may, we have missed these stories in the past few weeks. <laughs> All right. That, uh, that's our paper. And I have a couple of emails for you. Uh, one is from Hunter who writes, greetings, twim crew. I recently learned of a new game. Currently getting ready for alpha and crowdfunding where players will edit microbes at the genetic level and pit them against microbes created by other players. The game is called Cure and the website is curethegame.com and um, they got quite a website there. I haven't played it. I don't know if you can play it online or if it's an app or what. Not sure, but... I'm curious. Do they start with real genomes? Or is this Don't hypothetical? Know. Don't know. And what's the host? Yeah. Because, you know, how do you control the host and the host responses? You know, maybe they have solved immunology for us. <laughs> Use genetic engineering to create unique microbes of your design. I'm trying to see here. Gameplay. Let's see if you can do it here. Uh, I don't know if it's it's available yet. But, you know, whether you get a DNA sequence or it's just more vague than that. I mean, they're showing a DNA strand on the website, but anyway, listeners should check it out. It claims to be accurate based on current scientific knowledge and to have been reviewed by teachers and scientists. Hmm. Being a gamer and super interested in microbiology, this was right up my alley, and I figured I probably wasn't the only Twix fan who would be interested in this. Hunter. Hunter, by the way, has been has written to Twiv, and he works for Blizzard Entertainment, and some listeners will recognize that. As the makers of WoW, the famous game, World of Warcraft. Oh. I'll have to, have to check out this Cure the Game. I always like the virus games that are out there. Um, it's Yeah, it's in, it's in alpha, so it's not out yet. You can't play it, right? I'll check it out. I'm not a gamer, but I'll check it out. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, Anthony sends us a link to a store where you can buy a T-shirt with a tardigrade on the front. Ooh. Right, we talked about tardigrades uh did we? Yes, a couple of yeah, weeks we ago. Yeah, we did. We right. ha- we actually have the anima the animatronic version That's right. on the website. <laughs> so this is a cool T-shirt on the front. It's got a picture of a tardigrade, and it says "Live tiny, die never." It's just <laughs> it's great, really great, a great graphic. I could get this T-shirt. This would be cool. That is really beautiful. Thank you, Anthony. And our last one is from Dennis, who writes: "Hi, Docs, regarding Twim One Hundred and Twenty." And tube worm metamorphosis stimulated by a bacterium. What a fascinating observation. Dr. Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan in their book, Acquiring Genomes, have a chapter titled Seaworthy Alliances, in which Dr. Williamson's work is quoted in which he's claimed that invertebrates owed their transformations from larval forms to radically different looking adult forms to acquired genomes. He did experiments to cross invertebrate sea urchin fathers with chordate mother sea squirts. Not only did the fertilized eggs survive this bizarre coupling, but they developed fully parental paternal larvae, the immature forms called plutae. Some of these weird hybrid forms survived up to 90 days from hatching. There's much more detail, and he begged for some independent group to try the same experiments, but I've never heard more of this kind of work. 
Margulis' entire book was dealing with the question of how some animals develop with wildly different phases, for example, from embryo to larva to pupa to adult. I wonder if the observation of the bacterium stimulating a tube worm transformation will also stimulate more work in either expanding on or correcting the theory of acquired genomes in higher forms of animals. Have you any thoughts on the theory of acquired genomes? We know that many life forms acquire viral DNA and bacterial DNA. How about higher forms of acquired DNA? I don't know what you mean by that, but certainly there is, I mean, among bacteria, there's tons of gene transfer, right? Well, we also have retroviruses in our genome. We have and, retroviruses that transfer. But, and viruses that pick up cellular DNA and transform it. Yes. Is there, is there any known mechanism of of eukaryotes just picking up naked DNA and incorporated it, incorporating it? I mean, I don't see why, right? DNA is everywhere and it can get mm-hmm. into cells. I mean, I think people are really curious about it. And in fact, when, when we talked about horizontal gene transfer a number of episodes ago, there was we had a little discussion at the beginning. Um, maybe that was the tardigrade episode, right? <laughs> Hence the question. <laughs> and I think that that's the, that's what I remember that in eukaryotes, we we believe that there is horizontal gene transfer, not just viral mediated, but other ways. But it's hard to show. But certainly, Dennis, that's what people are interested in. So this whole idea of crossing different species, of course, a species is defined as the offspring are not viable, right? We had a guy on on our new podcast. We have a brand new podcast called This Week in Evolution, Tuivo. And last episode, number four, I think, uh, we had a guy who was trying to figure out why you get inviability in offspring of the crossing of different species. And he was using two different fruit fly species to do this. And he actually identified a couple of genes that are required for uh, the inviability of offspring. The idea being you don't want to cross different species, Mm. right? They want to remain separate. So it's a way to protect your genome. Exactly. Your lineage. And your little niche in the world as well, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Really interesting stuff. There's so many cool things going on out there. And you know, Dennis, people get smarter and they get better techniques and they get good cores. They could do the experiments. Computational Mm -hmm. biology. Yep. The computational aspect is amazing as well. Mm -hmm. All right. That is TWIV, uh, not TWIV. This is TWIM 122. (laughs) A little slip, right? You can find it at iTunes and also at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. Or you can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIM. And we love getting your questions and comments. Please send them to twim at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you both. And Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Vincent and Michelle. Borrelia. Borrelia. <laughs> I'm Vincent Dracaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I would like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, and in particular, Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for their technical behind-the-scenes help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can hear his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.